I'm so happy to be here today. I have a special surprise for you guys. Besides the fact that Mary Electra, a most amazing sound healer and massage therapist uh, that I've met recently at Conspiracy Con and UFO Con, uh, she'll be with us today for about an hour, and then at 6 o'clock, Dr. Richard Miller will show up, and he'll talk to Mary for about 10 or 15 minutes about sound healing and what he knows about sound and uh, vibration and light and all kinds of crazy things that he, as a mad scientist, knows all about. He'll be showing up for the last hour of our show today. As a matter of fact, I may do a live broadcast from his house up in uh, Grants Pass, Oregon, uh, in the first week of January for my New Year's Eve type of show that, you know, whenever New Year's Eve is that week. So anyhow, keep your fingers crossed because that would be a wild ride indeed if I could do that. And it looks like my, my amazing new friend, Mary Electra, is with us. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring her on. Mary, are you there? I'm here. How are you? I'm wonderful. Hey, it's so Great. good to have you on the show, you know. Uh, we met at UFO Con, and I, yeah. you know, I, I didn't want to read your bio as much as I really would like you to tell the audience more about yourself, <laughs> because, um, yeah, no, I think that'd be wonderful. So why don't you go ahead and give us a little introduction as to who Mary Elector is and what you do oh. and, and about your sound healing. Well, basically, um, I was a, a very ordinary person doing very ordinary things, and um, but I had been told by people for a long time that when I turned 45, I'm giving you a hint about my age, when I turned 45, I would be moving into what I came to the earth for, and that there uh, was a, a, a reason for all of us to be here, and I was going to be fulfilling my reason after I turned 45. So that's when I started doing massage. And I became acquainted with someone by the name of Tom Kenyon, who does sound healing. And the very before I even went to his in the beginning of his workshop, before it started, I got this message that he had a message for me. And normally I don't hear things in my my mind. I don't hear voices, but this one was a pretty clear voice. And so I went up to him and I said, I understand you have a message for me. And he kind of looked at me very flabbergasted and said, well, maybe after the workshop, I'll have more information for you. So after the workshop, he told me that I would be channeling the Hawthors. And I thought, wow, this is kind of interesting because that's what he does. And I was just wondering if he was really, really giving me a, a message or if he was just, you know, appeasing me for that moment. Yeah, so. Uh, who yes. are who are the Hawthors? Is that what you said okay. it was? Yes. The, okay. The Hawthors are these uh, beings, fourth dimensional beings. They're they're from the fourth dimension of Venus. Oh, cool. So they're okay. Fourth dimensional beings, and they appear there in very tall light forms, and in um, the the energy of the Hawthors is embodied in the goddess Hawthor, which. Um, a lot of the uh, statues to Hathor were uh, defiled by the Romans because she represented uh, hedonistic practices in their opinion. Because she was full of joy, love, laughter, sensual energy, basically. She was the mother, you know, uh, mother move. She looks like that cow face. And, uh, oh, yes. She's, she's, uh, she's, a, uh, she's the mother of Isis, and I think. Don't quote me on that one. I think that's my memory is saying that. But the goddess Hathor embodied the spirit of the Hathor beings, which are from the fourth dimension of Venus. And so Tom works with those beings when he does his sound work. And so he told me I would be channeling that energy through me as well. So um, I kind of thought, well, you know, I, I didn't quite, I didn't know quite what to think, actually. But it turned out that um, I loved Tom's workshop. And I need to preface all this a little bit by telling you that I believe that we are all 
an aspect of spirit, that each of us embody an aspect of the divine, that we're all connected. And within that, we have the vibration of all things living within us. So, um, mm-hmm. and, and I believe that Earth is just a place where we remember who we are, not learn who we are, just remember who we are. So with that awareness, uh, in Tom's workshops, um, he did sound. And I love, they were much more experiential. You know how when you go to a conference, you just listen to a lot of information? Well, Tom yes. had information. He had a lot of information about the Egyptian mythology and how it related to sound. Because, you know, sound really stemmed, there was a whole sound clinic, healing clinic in uh, Egypt, in uh, Memphis, in Saqqara, actually. And so it's a sound healing temple. And then the... Hawthors were um, music and sound and song were really a part of, of their uh, energy and vibration. So um, Tom's workshops were very experiential, and I love that. I, I love that. And so the next workshop he was doing, I wanted to attend it, but I was at that moment just beginning my, my massage practice because I do massage. And I was just beginning to practice, and so I was a little financially challenged. So uh, I was granted the opportunity to do chair massage for the attendees of his workshops, kind of like I do at the uh, conference. I do sure, chair massage, a conspiracy you know? con so, and UFO right. con, yes. Right. So I had my chair there, and during breaks and stuff like that, uh, or if people needed to release energy that was like being built up from the work we were doing, uh, I did the massage, and I attended the workshops for doing the massage. So it was just this wonderful thing. But I, for a year and a half, I did this. I traveled all around uh, working with Tom all around the, the western United, you know, the, the California, Nevada, I mean, California, Arizona. I went and to Mary, Hawaii with her. I have a question about yes. Tom. What is Tom's last name again? I'm not hearing it Tom, too well. Tom Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-N. Okay, and is he still alive and with us? Oh, of course he's alive. He's well, and he still does sound, and he still channels the Hawthors, and he still sends out messages um, from the Hawthors, and he does workshops, and he does sound healing. Work. You know, he teaches people sound healing, and uh, he's just amazing. But for me, what he was doing was re-stimulating my consciousness of sound, because uh-huh. basically I am a sound healer, and I needed to remember that, and there was no one in my world until that time that even had a consciousness of what sound healing was, and there was Tom, you know, playing crystal bowls and toning, basically. So uh, the, the one of the trips I took with Tom was to... Um, the big island of Hawaii, and we were going swimming with the dolphins. And for some reason, circumstances prevailed. And the first night I was there, I was out in the hot tub. At, um, I was in the hot tub about three o'clock in the morning, Hawaii time. I hold this one second. <coughs> and I was out there, and I'd never had contact before, conscious contact with beings before. But there in the sky were these lights in the formation of the Kabbalah Tree of Life. Oh, my God. And I knew that they, these were beings. I knew that they were beings. I knew that they were working with me. I knew they were healing me. And I knew they were preparing me. And I knew it was all good. I just knew it in my heart. And anybody could have told me a 100,000 things, but I knew. And what was happening is these lights that were in the configuration of the Kabbalah Tree of Life would send like a laser beam to the next light. And they had a pattern that they were moving in. And each time the laser hit one of the lights, it would start pulsating, which I knew was a communication and a healing, and it was what it was doing was realigning my body 
to bring through energy that I would be working with in the future. Oh. But I had to be, I had to be reconfigured, so to speak. I would have never been able to do what I do with the DNA patterns I had at the time. And so, and, and this is all out of my own knowing. So, you know, I'm not science proven or anything like that. I just know from my own heart, which I think is the best place of knowing there is, uh, and I know it, and go ahead and ask the question. I'm, okay. I'm still fascinated. I'm just so fascinated about your tree of life uh, alien contact. I think that is just, that is, I've never heard of that before. So it was you amazing. Go ahead. Well, can you ask tell me, me about how how you knew you were communicating with aliens? Did they actually talk to you telepathically, or did you just feel it? Or well, I felt spirit. it. I felt it, and also it was like a knowing in my heart. I can't explain it. I knew they were communicating. I knew I understood it. I knew very clearly I understood it. I just knew I couldn't articulate what I knew. Can there I were ask words you? Or like that. Can I ask you one more question about that, and then we'll move on? Um, I've told the audience my story, I think I told them, boy, you know, I've told so many stories I can't remember, but I told them about the night I was falling asleep, and I think an angel or an alien or something came to the side of my bed and touched me in the middle of my forehead as I was dropping off to sleep, and I felt uh -huh. the most profound feeling of love that I've ever felt in my entire life. And I didn't want. I woke up the next day, and I and I would not get out of bed for three days. I did not want to be here, and I was seriously contemplating suicide because this place seemed so mundane and so boring to me at the time, and uh -huh. so unloving. I I mean, I can't uh -huh. even describe it to people. Did you have any experience when they were healing you? Is that the feeling you got? Was it a, a joyfulness of heart, a love of heart, um, a feeling of? Um, Oneness with the universe. Um, what was it like? Oneness, one, a oneness with the universe. I felt great joy. Great joy. I felt a sense of peace, and I felt that I was home. Yeah. You know, the, that's very the, similar the, uh, to the feeling the beans, I got, too. Yeah. The beans gave me a sense of home, a sense of uh, being home, being connected. Um, oh, which I okay. didn't really... See, I didn't have so much of that in my life on the, this planet here, you know. I always felt a little disjointed, a little like, you know, I, I still kind of feel that way. At, you know, like I, I really don't belong in some ways. And when yeah. I was a very little, very, very little girl, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I came from a family of nine, and I was the seventh born, and everyone knew that my mother gave birth to me. But I would tell people that I was adopted. And I would said, no, you're not adopted. Your mother gave birth to you. And I said, I know. I know. But I'm really adopted. I'm really a star. I'm really a star. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, you know, hey, oh, been... A long time ago, I knew I was a star. <laughs> See, there you are. Um, but I was... What I'm taking from this is something that I think a lot of people who have healing abilities or have contact with uh, other species that not necessarily hear or ghost or dimensional creatures of sorts, I, any of us that have had these experiences throughout our life have always felt like we don't belong here. And uh, I, I totally get that. And uh, yeah. it's very interesting that you brought that up because I'm yeah. trying to find somebody who's done a study on that, on that feeling of disconnectedness to this planet or our parents or, you know, anything from an early age. And uh, one of these days I'll find that person. But yeah, in the meantime, somebody should be doing that, don't you think? I mean, everyone, welcome back to the Fenton Perspective here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. It's that time again, folks. It's time to give up that Starbucks coffee this week and donate whenever you can to Revolution Radio. As you know, we're all listener supported here, and we really need your help to keep us, you know, free away from all the commercials that, uh, you know, 
<laughs> okay, I'm starting to laugh because in my head I'm hearing Berkey water filters and buy heirloom seeds. and <laughs> I'm starting to hear all that, folks. So if you would, if you would please, please, please help keep us afloat so we don't have to have as many uh, advertisements on here as uh, we do, you know, as we're trying not to be like everybody else. So there you go. So donate that uh, $5 for that cup of coffee to Revolution Radio whenever you can. Thanks a lot for doing it. I really appreciate it. Okay, Mary, well, we're back on, dear. So um, where were we? We were at uh, the part about love and uh, the experience you had with the the beans. Oh, and the, your... the beans, yes, yes. Um... Yeah, it was uh, it was an amazing experience, and I I knew it was magical. And every night for the every five night? nights I was every night for the five nights I was there, I was pulled out to that pool and to that hot tub, and I um, got that healing. And I told everybody, <laughs> I was telling everybody, because wow. for me it was so it was real because. You know, I was seeing into the dimensions. I was seeing through the dimensions. And other people come out and they, you know, go, oh, it's just your glasses. It's just a, they have 101 reasons. But, you know, the thing is, is that it, it, I want just everybody out there listening to this to, to just hear what I'm saying. If you have an experience, you feel it, you know it. You don't need another person to tell you that you've had exactly. it. Exactly. It That's is real. True. It is real. Because, you know, I went on a dolphin swim on that same trip. Uh-huh. And there were 40 people at this conference in Hawaii. So they put us in pods. They put everybody in pods. Now, for some, there was a reason I didn't go out the second time. And I won't get into that because that's another whole magical story of, being able to see into other dimensional realities, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of stories I could tell you. But anyhow, I was on the boat watching everybody swimming with the dolphins, and the dolphins were just swimming and you know flipping and spinning and stuff, and they were within oh six feet of every person in the water, and I was watching them, and I was just so delighted until. Uh, I was uh, pulled into another interdimensional kind of re, um, experience with the dolphins. But anyhow, I was watching them. And then when the people came on board, back on the boat, only five people said they experienced dolphins. And it became very, very clear to me is that you only see when you're ready or willing to mm-hmm. see. So they, they, they could be things out here in our reality that, People are seeing and other people can't because they're not ready to see it. They're unwilling to see it. They don't have the belief. They don't have the consciousness. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Exactly. Because we are multidimensional. You, you know, we really are a multidimensional um, consciousness. And so we, we have the ability to see in the other dimensions. And so these other dimensional beings were working with me in in that December, those five nights in December, and they were really preparing me. And since I last talked to you, actually, somebody did a little reading with me. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I had someone um, that I met at the UFO conference who was a hybrid. Um, oh, wonderful. She, um, I can't tell you her name or anything like that because she doesn't. She doesn't want to be out. Oh, yeah, sure, no oh, problem. Or anything like that, and so I'm, I don't want to say that. But, you know, um, I, I, I started toning in 1997 using this sound. And okay. in 1999, I went to Egypt. And in Egypt, I was told that I needed to go there because they were going to download me with special frequencies oh. to support this dimension. So when I went to e- Egypt. I had two people besides my own my own inner consciousness saying that I needed to go to this Egypt trip, and I went in May. And I went with um, someone from who had put it onto the UFO conference down in Laughlin. Her name was it was Ivy West, and and you know Lloyd Pye was there, and uh, can't remember Stephen's last name. 
uh, Christopher Dunn, Jordan Maxwell. It was oh, just wonderful, cool. wonderful conference. Anyhow, we were there, and I was just, I had to go. And I had already booked a trip to go to England, you know, for the crop circles, because I was doing a closing ceremony for the crop circle symposium that year. Oh, so, cool. here, but here I was being called in to go to this trip to, to Egypt. So I worked out an arrangement with Ivy, which was really a gift from God, and she was really wonderful to um, work this with me, because I did sound and massage on the at, for the conference people. And uh, so when we went, I had two two days before I got on the plane, I had two people at the WESAC conference in Mount Chasta tell me that I was going to be given a gift on my upcoming trip. And one of them specifically saw me being handed a rod or a staff. And they said, do you understand this? And I said, well, actually I do because in Egypt, in the hieroglyphs, those rods and staffs are toning forks, or some of them are, and tuning right. forks that they use for healing, and some of them were for other things, but they, you know, uh, it did support their sound healing. And so I knew immediately when he said he saw me, that I was being handed a rod or a staff, uh, and a staff, a music staff, you know, uh, it had to do with music. So, um, and the sound. So I was like all excited, and I went, and I was just waiting for this thunder to hit me, <laughs> like you know, lightning to hit me, or something. And I went through the three weeks, and I was toning everywhere, and I, you know, I was in the king's chamber, and I toned in the sarcophagus in the king's chamber, and and we did ceremonies, and I went to the uh, place where the hathors, uh they have some, um, it's the site that you're, you know, you're not supposed to be able to go to, so we kind of gone and almost got put in jail. But anyhow, that's another story. <laughs> that's another old story. Anyhow, we, we had a lot of fun and we went to Saqqara and we went to the sound going in temples there and stuff. So I had this amazing trip, but nothing happened, right? So I'm going, boy, were we all wrong? This was like, you know. So six months, six months, this is in 1999. We aren't using digital cameras yet. We're still using those little throwaway cameras and stuff. Six months after the trip, Marge, one of the ladies on the trip, she um, called me and said she was sending me a picture, that I wouldn't believe this. And she took a picture of me inside the sarcophagus, and I'm toning with my crystal bowl, and there is an orb the size of a basketball on the top of my crown. Oh. And I know I'm absorbing these new frequencies, these other dimensional frequencies that are not of this world. They are coming to me through this uh, avenue. And now, I, Mary, I was, can I, can I ask, did you, at the time that this picture was snapped, did you know you were actually downloading these frequencies or that you made, you, I wish I was that conscious. <laughs> I wish I was that conscious. Well, then let Absolutely me ask you, not. Oh, that's interesting. Let me ask you this then. Since that, since that time in the sarcophagus, have you been uh -oh. able to tone at different levels that you were unaware of uh, before that time? Well, yes, yes, probably. You know, I don't hear my sound the way you do or the way other people do. But okay. when people hear my sound, they always say it's not from this world. They always say that I have a perfect pitch, which I don't. If I was singing, I wouldn't have. Um, they tell me that it's, you know, remarkable. When you experience it in your body, if I tone into your body, uh, when you get beyond the weirdness, um, you can feel the vibrations in your body. Some very magical, miraculous things have happened with the sound. And um, I, I know that sound is opening portals for people in this dimension to open them to their higher dimensional self so that they, uh, because we are, the, the veils are thinning in our world now. Uh, the dimensions are getting, there's, there's less veils between the dimensions. And well, so, Mary, um, what, what I think what I think I'm hearing you say is that the vibrations between the dimensions um, are are getting faster or slower, and they're aligning with each other. Is that what I'm hearing? I would say it's faster because when it's dense, the vibration is very slow. 
And when okay. it's faster, when it, you know, because light is vibration, and the faster that light is going, changes the color. So well, when it's a slow exactly. vibration, it reds and it goes. So when when we're in these dimensional states, the the the, the energy vibrations are slower, and then now they're it's speeding up, and that's why they think everything is speeding up. I mean, people say, "Oh, everything's speeding up now," and I think they're doing that because the vibrations are speeding. But for uh -huh. just practical purposes, you just can imagine that these dimensions have always been here, right? They're right, right in front of us at the moment. I mean, they just exist. But there have been these curtains, and you weren't able to see beyond the curtains, so to speak. And right. now the curtains are opening, and instead of, uh, and what's behind them are shears. <laughs> or, you know, so, you know, there, there were these heavy curtains, there were these, you know, first there were these blinds, and then you open the blinds, and then there were curtains, and then there were the shears. And, you know, and that's how we're shifting uh, consciously into an, uh, uh, into the fourth and fifth dimension. Consciously. Sure. And, and do you think this has a lot to do with the galactic alignment or the fact that our DNA is actually um, crystallizing into a new form of DNA? I think it's both. Okay. I don't think I one do could happen without the other, actually. Exactly. To be yeah. honest with yeah. you, because I just don't think so. Because I think when Earth was chosen for uh, this uh, illusionary experiment, you know, of finding ourselves, uh, it, it's a wonderful playground for experience. Earth is, is really that. Oh, so, it in is. my opinion, this is my opinion. You know, these are, these are all just the world well, according to Mary. But I'm right there with you, dear. But you know, yeah. we're women. We're older. We've been through a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, actually, I think you know, if you talked to me when I was a teenager in my twenties, I I was going through my angst period, and I may not uh -huh. have said the same thing I'm saying right now at 55. You know, so yeah, um, I yeah. don't. I don't know. Actually, I always had these deep thoughts. To be honest, I always have. It's just I've been crazy all my life, and uh, I've been a I have been an ex all my life. By the way, so back yeah. to back to this woman who uh, you know how. So when I started doing this, when after I got back from after I got back from uh, Egypt, I had these um, you know the veils are, are very thin for me, and so. I move in and out of dimensions quite frequently, not knowing that I'm, <laughs> you know, I'll be describing something to you. You can't even, what are you talking about? Anyway. Oh, but, no, uh, I, you. My group, <laughs> I, I would say my listeners and, uh, you know, uh -huh. my group of friends and everybody that listens to this show, believe me, we're right there with you. So, um, you know, anything you want to share that you think is way profound, I'm sure it's just like almost everyday antics to them. So. <laughs> well, I don't know that it's profound, but I do know that I, I, I see things and other people are going out. Really. Anyhow, but that, but anyhow, so after after these things started happening and my uh, my time with the beans in 1995 and then my time in, in Egypt in 99, um, I, I started you know, really moving more quickly into my uh, higher consciousness. And um, the things started happening. And I started, you know, um, I, went, I went to, I went on all these trips in 1999. I went to all these places and I think downloaded information and got information. I was even deported when I went from, uh, I was going to Australia and they did, I got deported into New Zealand because there was something that I, I needed from New Zealand that Australia wasn't going to give me. And I would have never known to go to Australia. And I spent two months there. And then when I came home, I sold everything and I started traveling around the earth, through, oh, oh, around Gaia, uh, you know, the United States. And I was doing sound work with uh, Gaia, Earth. And I would stop and do sound healing and stuff. And... Um, I got bit by a brown spider, and the brown spider, it, it nearly killed me, and I didn't know for a long, long time that it was a brown spider that bit me, and so I was, uh, I had all this poison in my system, and it just, it changed my life kind of profoundly in, in many ways. Wow, and now, so, Mary, uh, 
Mary, yeah. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but everything you've just said in the last 30 seconds is just amazing. So what I want to ask you about is, now you started traveling around the United States. You were doing sound mm-hmm. healing. Were you just uh, putting on workshops? Were you no, traveling no. in a car? Were you just or I was just in going? a camper van. I was in a camper van, and I was in a, in a um, mobile home. Uh, I had gotten married to someone I met in New Zealand who was much younger than I was. I, he might have been good a dark. Good for you. i got to say right now, have, good for you, yeah. high fives and all that. <laughs> well, I, I, he, might have been, he might have been from the dark forces, you know. Oh. Because he well, was really, you, you know, and I, you know, I'm really susceptible to that love thing, so it would be one way for people to knock me over. Because what I was saying to you is all these, all these things started shifting and changing in my life. Now, the work I was doing with Gaia was amazing. It was what I was called to Denver. I can't tell you how many times, and I did sound work in Denver. I can't tell you. And now I've never called back there, but I, like I was called there a lot. And when I would go places, I would feel the vibrations of the land, and I would stop, and I'd just pull over the car, and I'd start toning and doing a healing with Gaia with the sound because Gaia is very, very receptive to the sound. So anyhow, I was doing this work. And everything was going kind of okay. And um, then two th- then 9-11 happened. And, of course, that changed everything vibrationally. Now, people weren't you really know, aware of how much it was changing. Everything yeah, vibrational. can you go into that a little bit? Because uh, uh, that just blows my mind. When I heard you, you mentioned that once at UFO Con, we were talking about Conspiracy Con, and somehow you were talking to a, another woman. Anyhow, bottom line is, I was fascinated about the fact uh, of the 9-11. So can you expand upon that for a little bit for us? Well, about the change? You know, I, first of all, I do believe there are dark horses who are um, that started out as white horses and found their power very early. And um, they, you know, in this dimension, found their power and found out how uh, invigorating it is to have power over something. You know, right. it's such an elixir, basically. And so I think these dark force energies started out benevolently in some way, but then, you know, they just kind of cut, wrapped up in this um, experience in this illusion of, of this dimension of the and you know the density and, and everything that this earth provides, the polarity that this earth provides. Anyhow, they got kind of caught up in it and it has like amassed to a level that is worldwide, you know, universally wide. And they would prefer that now that the shifts and everything are taking place they would prefer that the consciousness not rise, <laughs> you know, that that they be able to be the bully. So okay. I think, it's, I think it's so interesting that, you know, the consciousness of bullying is coming up because it's been there forever. But, you know, the only way to really stop a bully is to stop being in fear. You know, oh, boy. Up the bully. That's how you, you know. Stop it. I could do a whole show just on all the people I've talked to that are in many different modalities of healing this planet and healing our consciousness. And that is the bottom line for every one of them: is if you can get out of the fear, then none of this can bother you ever again. Yeah. And I'm, you yeah. know, it, it really well, is the key. Well, and so 9/11 was this um, fear infusion. Yes. Because. Um, people were starting, things were starting to shift. Consciousness of the masses was starting to shift. And the only way to pull back the reins of that is to set fear into motion. Uh, Fear triggers a lot of things. And it allows the um, manipulation and control to continue. Mm -hmm. It's all based on the fear. So 9-11 was a totally fear-based um, event. It was to instill fear. Uh, a lot happened at that time. A lot of what, I mean, people were willing to give away everything because they were in fear. And it, it, it was kind of interesting to watch 
the uh, it was interesting to stand outside and watch how people got led down this path, and now they're crazed about it. They're very upset about um, homeland security and everything. But they gave that you know they were in such fear. They just said, "Okay, go ahead, do it." Go ahead, do yeah, it. I, yeah, I exactly. You know, and not realizing that safety doesn't doesn't stand in fear. It doesn't stand in fear. It stands in your strength. But anyway, so at 9-11 changed the vibrational frequency of this planet. It knocked it, uh, it wobbled it in, in a certain way. I can't explain that to you, but it did. No, I, I and, understand that because, Mary, I think that the World War II, World War One, I, I think that all of that did the same thing. And I took it took many, many years for us to get over the vibrations of World War Two, just like it did World War One, just like it, it's going to do with uh, World War Three when it happens over in the Middle East and all the things that are going on with that. Um, and, you know, and if... <sighs> Gosh, you know, it's like I always say, if everybody would just not go to war, we wouldn't have one. So, yeah, Well, I know how to stop wars, you know. It, oh, actually, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, those countries or beings or people who want to go to war, well, what we do is we take them, those individual peoples or those, you know, the people at the head of the society that wants to go to war, and uh, we take them out and give them a pistol and let them turn their backs on each other, walk 10 steps, turn around and shoot. <laughs> and whoever, <laughs> whoever dies, they lose. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Yeah, because, no, I totally you know, and, agree with you on that. And you, and you just tell me how many of those people would go out there and risk their lives if their yeah, life was on the line for yeah. whatever. Because it's never about a cause. It's always about money. It's always about power. And the only That's way right. you get the only way you get a sane man, and I wrote this in my book, the only way you get a sane man to go and give his life for something is he has to believe there's a cause behind it. And they That's have right. used religion. They have used religion, and that because religion is something people believe they're going to find themselves in, and re, so religion is very close to the heart, close to humanity, the heart of humanity. And so um, they are all looking for what the, the something beyond themselves, basically, which there really probably isn't anything beyond themselves, but they're looking for the answers, you know, basically. And religion is that key to that. And that's why they've used religion very, very effectively to manipulate and control the masses. And um, it, so religion is really more about a control center than it is about spirituality. Spirituality is so different than religion. Exactly. But, exactly. Um, and Mary, so I, 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 I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm yes, you are. Oh. You are talking to the lady who wants everybody to build a guillotine in their, in their, in their garage. Oh, my God. You know, it's so interesting because we started out with sound healing, and now we're ending up a little bit more into politics and, and uh a little I more spiritualism, it. and I love that about you. I knew we'd have a, a really, you know, kind of all over the place experience today. Um, now our break is coming up soon, and then okay. what I'd like for you to do right now, Mary, is tell people what website they can go to, how they can buy your okay. book. Um, well, that you would can be go to where you can buy my book is on um, um, Amazon, and you, it, and the, the name of the book is. Um, Time to be alive, and alive is uh, an acronym for acknowledge and live in your vibrational essence. It's time oh, to cool. acknowledge and live in your vibrational essence. So I'm going to change the name of the title to uh, Own Your Magic. But anyhow, that hasn't happened yet. So the title is still Time to Be Alive, and it's by Mary Alex. Welcome back, everybody, to the in perspective here on Revolution Radio with my special guest today, Mary Electra, and we've been joined by my other very special guest, Richard Allen Miller, Dr. Richard Allen Miller. He is just an amazing guy. I spent a weekend with him, not a weekend, I'd say like a whole day, wasn't it, Richard? Four days. Four days. Well, you know, <laughs> It was four days, wasn't it? We started, oh, you didn't on, on Thursday or Friday, did 
No, I didn't. I didn't show up until I think Sunday, and then it felt like four days, though. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh -huh. No, I enjoyed well, my. Yeah. Well, Richard, I'd like you to meet my other special guest today, Mary Electra. Say hello to Dr. Richard Miller. He's done some sound, uh, you know, uh, why well, I wanted to say scientific endeavors into sound and sound healing. Cool. And I'd love for you two to have a little chat. So I'm going to bow out and let you two go at each other. How's that sound? <laughs> well, that's unfair. I don't even know her. Oh, well, 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 I'm well, easy well, to get to know. <laughs> I'm easy to get to Fred, I love that comic book. I, which one? Electra. Oh, don't you? I, I didn't know there was a comic book named after me. No, <laughs> there is. They even made a movie out of it. I think probably I named myself after that, actually. <laughs> so, I no, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm sorry? I didn't know about it. Oh, well, I've got the comics. I collect comics. There you are. I'm a little prep kid, and that's what I do. Um, How cool. Basically, in sound and uh, color uh, and uh, light, if you will, I did uh, three books uh, for Navy Intelligence when I worked out of anesthesiology. It was on video feedback systems. And uh -huh. in 1974, Dr. – he's now a doctor um, – a man named Gary Robert Buchanan uh, did his doctoral thesis in music. He became a conductor and all that kind of thing. But he spent all of his hours on his doctoral thesis in the medical library, and so his, uh, his thesis uh, board required – a physicist, and that was me. And I was on his review board for orals and his presentation, which his thesis topic at that time, 1974, was titled Synesthesia, Cross-Modal Translations of Senses. And wow. today, today he, he has a, a healing center in Reno, Nevada, a Steamboat, Steamboat Springs Healing Center, where he has written a opus book called uh, Sona, using cymatic light and sound uh, frequencies uh, to actually cause changes in the physical body. And the yeah. three books that I've written on that subject, which is a little different take, um, I can now actually simulate any drug experience using light and sound. I can gate specific neurotransmitters and uh, release them in the brain using light and sound. And so those three books, uh, Jeremy Tarcher has those. He's right now Penguin uh, Publishing, but, but he was originally Tarcher Publishing when he took the books. He hasn't published them yet because he said, quote, the world isn't ready for them yet. It was basically the Diamond Body, Electromagic, and Yogatronics. And then, uh, and basically, using light and sound, we feed back that system using a uh, Mora and Indomet German acupuncture equipment fit on the head, and it's non-invasive where you can wave shape. And you can, by wave shaping, uh, talk to specific neurotransmitters. There is a science fiction book called Little Heroes by Norman Spinrad, where it's a science fiction story where Norman uh, suggests a thing called the wire, where uh, in the future, this came out of after Gibson and some others had been writing in that area, and basically you can put this little device on your head, and change your personality, your sex, anything that you'd care to do that's superficial like that. And uh, basically, it was all done with light and sound. That's military I, 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 absolutely, I absolutely believe it. I, don't, I really don't have any of your credentials, Dr. Miller, or anything like that. I just, uh, I just carry this sound through me, uh, and I home with my mouth, and that's how I do the work that I do. Um, I understand it to be magic, but it's nothing like what you're talking about. It's not, it's not as sophisticated. <laughs> you know uh, what I mean? It's just sophisticated. You know what the real the trip in on the whole thing is? It's not about the scientific explanation. If you can see it in your mind's eye, you've got it. That is where the real science occurs. It's not in our laws and, and understandings like that. It's basically a mind's eye. And light and yeah. sound 
are basically uh, uh, certain frequency bands that have resonance with other parts in your organs, your body. Right. And what you're doing is moving signals or information from one system well, to another. Because well, I don't know who actually determined this, but I know that Tesla uh, said that everything had a resonant uh, frequency. And then if you well, yeah, Nicola. That's why you gotta watch out for those flim flam guys. <laughs> you know, he's got all those upper buller hats over there in that big pile with uh, what is that, Schrodinger's cat too? Yeah, um, yeah. But is that uh, is that it's true? The resonant systems. That's what I am as a resonant right. physicist. I was the one that right. did Schumann's resonance. Uh, Voice of the Planet yeah. for Dr. Hainsworth. When he died uh -huh. uh, a number of years back, Perth, uh, in uh, North, uh, South Australia, uh, Murdoch University had me finish up his work. And uh, uh -huh. I was, there's Isaac Benthoff and some others have actually suggested, you know, there are resonant cavities in the body, like your aortic arch, that will cause a beating structure of the same exact frequency band as uh, 8.3, which is Schumann's resonance. And that's why okay. there's a lot going on between, you know, all kinds of systems like the Earth and uh, the atmosphere with your internal state functions. Right. Very interesting. And doesn't, doesn't the, um, uh, just to ask, doesn't uh, uh, sacred geometry play into that as well? And I'm having uh, some, not able to hear you very clearly. It's uh, bandwidth oh. or something. I'm, I'm not, your voice is just a widge muffled. If there's a way you can make that more tinny, it might help me. I'm an old seal, so both my eardrums are broken anyway, so I have an excuse. Oh. <laughs> I was, I, I, well, I, I'm, I'm talking on a cell phone, and it's probably like a conference call, but um, basically what I was asking is that sacred geometry has, plays a big part in... Oh, in yes, absolutely, yes. In fact, that, that is absolutely... That's where the cymatics and other things... You know, cymatics were originally observed where a Buddhist monk would chant across water, and the resonant pattern would set up an interference pattern that would be uh, like the triantra or something like that. It was sacred geometry, and that's how they would get their their chant correctly by setting up those standing waves. And when they could see the, the wave on the, on the water, then they knew that they were hitting the right pitch and, and things like that. That was called cymatics. Uh, that's, a what was it, that's a German doctor that, what's his name? Uh, he wrote the book, Cymatics, anyway. I'm not sure what, whom you're talking about there, you know, scientists that did cymatics and things in the 50s. This is uh, something well known. It had to do with drum drum physics or circular physics. Uh, what is that? That's, uh, I forget, there's special functions that you work up, vessel functions that would work with a drum uh, system, you know, a circular drum and, and with like a bowl of water. And that you would chant across it. They're suggesting the crop circles, some of the other phenomena that we see that we don't really have an explanation for, uh, is a result of sound uh, somehow resonating oh. in closed systems and creating geometry, yeah. I believe that is true, and I will tell you why. In 99, I was doing a closing ceremony at a crop circle in the a crop circle symposium in England, and we were in one of the crop formations, and I was, uh, it was in the shape of a snake. And I was at the end toning in my bowl, was on a uh, TV tray, and I was toning, and I was playing the bowl, and I swear to you, it was flax, was bending into the sound. And I kept trying to take it away, and it kept bending into the sound, and at that moment, I said, oh my God, this is frequencies that are bringing this down from either up or above the earth, and maybe both. And, I am um, so glad you didn't use the word vibration. <laughs> when I when someone uses that, it's like a cat taking claws down a chalkboard. Oh. Um, it's frequencies. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I uh, well, I try to be precise, you know, because the conceptual is once people get it and understand it in their mind's eye, um, that's the resonant thing that makes it all connect. I don't know how to explain it. Everything starts with imagination, and so it isn't from the external, and these frequencies 
our kind of uh, relationship to body parts and things like that, and even uh, acupuncture has some relationships with these things called pulses. And it's all, again, frequency bands. And what yeah. we're doing with sound and light is somehow moving uh, information from one part of the body to the other. Have you ever, okay. yeah, I mean, obviously you're familiar with Kundalini, yes? You, yes, you know, the chill I'm, I'm that goes yeah, yes, I'm, I'm Ooh, you yeah, know, I'm, you get that I'm little thing going up. <laughs> yeah, that, that it is. Actually, I studied that for now. Um, you know, we're looking for, you know, whenever we can to find out there. What that is, basically, there is, on the central nervous system spine, there are a series of little cilia that stick out. Right. Okay, and what happens is you get a standing wave that goes up or down the spine. Right. Richard, yes. I think we're off we're the back. air, and if people can hear we us, back. we'll be right back, so hold on. We are back. We are back. We are back. Okay, sorry, folks, we got knocked off the air again, and Richard was just saying uh, something about okay, the yeah, pineal the, gland. The little cilia on the central nervous system it actually has signals going up or down. You can feel them, and it's that little chill. You, go, you know, you feel uh -huh. the little, yeah. Well, what that is is an electromagnetic signal going up or down the spine, usually up the spine. That's the good direction, if you will. It doesn't matter about Christian, but it's up or down. And that turns out that frequency band is actually in the visible light region. And why most religions all refer to the light. It's a, like a specific wave band, you know, visible light. It's not infrared, it's not ultraviolet, it's light, right. it's light band. Right. And it turns out the pineal gland, right there at the base of the skull, if you center your spine just right, and that light beam, you know, chill, which you can induce on your own with your own imagination, uh, will actually stimulate the pineal gland because originally it has atrophied now, but originally the, the pineal gland was your third eye. It was to regulate the body for seasonal changes, equinoxes and solstices, and you have shorter days and longer like that all was the way your body gated for changing mucus and other kinds of things in the body. It's atrophied now and we're all a wreck. But basically that's what it was originally about. And if you could stimulate the third eye with Kundalini, what would happen next is you would set up a standing wave in the neural cavity and on the thalamus is at the other end and could actually at any age generate true nerve tissue over glial cells. And in fact, mm. Robert O. Becker and I did that. He's a Nobel Prize winner. Becker and I proved that in, uh, was 1977, and it was in Department of Anesthesiology School of Medicine where they were doing the acupuncture studies. I, that we had a, a severed perineal down at the knee. The guy had droplet, and it took four and a half hour, uh, four and a half months to have enough nerve tissue by gravity falling down. It had the viscosity of like vitamin E or something like that. And it took about four and a half months to reach the knee and there was complete 100% regeneration of nerve tissue by stimulating the third eye with that chill, setting up a standing wave in the uh, neural cavity. What has happened as we get older our nutrition has dropped off to such an extent that we don't have a lot of trace minerals that are necessary to make a true nerve tissue up in the brain. And so you try to take uh, minerals, you know, that will cross the blood-brain barrier. The only way you can do that is with uh, neural peptides. And so uh, we created foods and we're trying to experiment with regenerating nerve tissue any place in the body. Um, it's possible to do that with using that concept of kundalini and that light band frequency that stimulates the pineal gland. I've written the technical I, paper. I believe, I believe that more. I believe that. I mean, I just absolutely know that's true. You get uh, the idea I, of how it works. I know. It's, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, because you, uh, you know, I don't do anything so sophisticated as you, but I, I do use sound, and I focus and I tone with my voice. That's why we chat. Yeah, that's... The whole purpose yeah, of what yeah, they, yeah. I, I, tone, I tone into their bodies, and I know that there are frequencies that exist in my voice that are kind of like um, that break up, they break up tumors, 
Um, I, I know that they have. It, um, I work, you know, I know I, I, I've had, you know, I have some testimonials to that, that tumors from cancer tumors have been broken up. But sound will break up something. And things like that. Yeah, you have to practice. That's what it's all about, practice. And at some point, uh, someone has to pitch, the right pitch and things of that nature. And by the way, I have observed, I haven't been able to prove it, but I have observed that it appears that homeostasis or different pitches are different people. Um, just like the amount of bacteria and levels of bacteria that you might have one person over another. There seem to be variations in some of that. Is that those so-called things that call the rays that you're working under or something like that? <laughs> Well, now, I don't you know, know uh, what do you know about the thymus? I mean, do you have any kind of information? I mean, look, for me, I have an intuitive understanding of the importance yeah, of Well, the intuition thymus. is just as valid. I, that's the yeah. whole point of what I try to say about the mind's eye. The intuition part is every bit as valid. It's just right now, this century, science is the leading religion of the world. You know, the, let there be light, and a physicist reaches over and goes, click, and it was good. You know, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. right. Well, it isn't real any more than anything else is. I mean, science, uh, I don't know any law in science that's lasted longer than 20 years. Maybe Maxwell's right-hand rule, hitchhiking out of the galaxy. I don't know about that part. But I do know that nothing <laughs> uh, is really written in stone. Uh, even yeah. our newest laws, our deepest understandings, they change within 20 years. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. And so intuition is just another resolution of the hologram. It's just as valid. And if you have it intuitionally, you have it physically. And so the physical, the emotional, there it is. The intuition is your lower brain, yeah? Yeah. Well, I, I definitely have an active, I do have an active uh, intuition and an active imagination as well, but a very active intuition. But the thymus, I understand to be, is very, very important to our ability to um, move interdimensionally. Um, we'll see that now. Now, now we're going to get into levels of consciousness. That's... <laughs> That's the level okay. of consciousness. That's why we, like John Curtis Gowan, et cetera, Ontologies okay. of Mystical States, talks about the prototaxic, the parataxic, and the syntactic modes of consciousness. You've got your trance, art, and creativity. And uh, the higher zona states are where you're doing it with more layers of the hologram, you know, like sex magic or kundalini, whatever. Those uh, Consciousness, where you have levels of your relationship to the understanding of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's what is where the richness of life actually lies. Actually, it's wonderful. To be able to see all the layers, to be able to step back like a witness. We were going to talk about birthing, too, at one point. You were really hip on that one. And, and all of it fits. It's all the same thing, because basically the brain... It's like a big crystal on top of an antenna, your body. And it's an amorphous semiconductor. It's got liquid crystal phases. It's changing every moment. And so basically the brain, the upper brain, can be seen as a, uh, let's say, a four-dimensional hologram of five space. And that means you can change the movie. That yeah. predicated on where your birth, where your setup sets up your belief systems and assumed truths and your values, and that sets up the movie that we're all currently enjoying, which I will call Horror on Elm Street. It's, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> well, there's other ways to be born, for example, and you can have like a dog, a puppy, has the concepts of devotion and love. Totally different than our agape, talama, or pago. It's it's um, uh, it's there's there's a relationship in the low level of the detail that you choose to participate in your awareness, and that's where I'm trying to show that there's a possibility of you know it's the same thing. And intuition is just the next layer above the physical thing, and then there's intellectual archetypal and formal above that. It's lovely. 
Yes, I need to interrupt you too, Mary and Richard. Yes. This has been fascinating listening to the two of you going, you know, through the paces here. But we're going to have a break in just about three or four minutes. And what I'd like to do for the last few minutes here, Richard, if you could just uh, hold on and I'll talk to you. After. <laughs> I'd like you to just hold on. And, and Mary, if you would give us again your website and um, any last parting words you have for us here today on sure. Revolution Radio. I, I would love to. Uh, my website is www.maryelector.com, but my blog site, which is the more interesting one, because uh, you can get CDs and stuff on my website, but, you know, uh, the blog site is Alchemy in Action Sacred Journeys. Dot com alchemy in action sacred journeys dot com and you know one of the things that I wanted to do was give a sound healing to the world while we were online if I could do that in my last moment would that be yes. okay and it was wonderful talking to you doctor and um, I maybe I'll get a chance to meet you one of these days but I'd like to just share the sound to, in, to, with the world and set out an intention of the sound is to do um, the healing that is in the highest best interest for the all. Okay. Wonderful. So, uh, so and, go for it. And I'll just <laughs> I'll just tone out, and then you can go into the break, and I'll leave you guys to a wonderful conversation. So here I go. Everybody, just breathe. Close your eyes and breathe, and just receive the sound. <laughs> That was wonderful. Um, you know, I want to ask you one quick thing before our break. I think it's coming up in about two minutes. I, that was, you know, I could feel my head resonating. That was so amazing. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was, have you ever heard of the who man sound? Is that similar to what you do? And I just heard about this the other night. It was last night, actually, on the, another a program that I was on. And uh, it's very similar to what you're doing, and I'm wondering if they're the same thing. Do you know about this? Well, they, I do not know about it, and they could be because I don't think there's anything new under the sun. I have been told that what I'm bringing through is very unique and that there isn't anyone else uh, that m made the decision to do it. I guess it was something that people had opportunities to bring through or beings had opportunity to do and they chose not to do it. But I, I have only been told that. I ha don't have any real actual awareness of it. I just know in, from my heart, from my heart, that the sound that I'm bringing through is, um, is serving people in some way. Oh, wow. It's, it's so wonderful. Well, Mary, I'm going to let you go, and I just yes. want to let you know that I will be in touch with you very soon because now that the listening audience knows who you are, I'm going to try to get you to all of my conferences next year in 2013, and I'm putting on about four of them. So I hope you're willing oh, to come in, and we'll open uh, maybe the you know two or three of the conferences. Uh, there is po a good possibility that I'll have you open the days with uh, some sound healing for the group. If you're willing to, to do that type of thing. Yes, that's the so, yes. As, as long as I can, as long as I can, uh, as long as I can, uh, uh, sit the, the chair massage in the back as well. <laughs> oh, sure. You know you're more than welcome to do that, of course. So okay, I'm going to I, I love it. Thank you so much for being on my show today. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry my dad interrupted, but hey, you'll be on again. So the, Thank you, and I'm interrupting. Yeah, and, and I hope so. I'd love to be on again. And I want to interrupt um, Dr. Miller's time because you are fascinating, and you have a lot to tell people. So I, oh, yes. I, I want well, to hear the rest of it. The jury's still yes, out on that one. What did you do? What did you say? I didn't hear it. I said the jury is still out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. I will. There you go, everyone. I finally found the unmute button. <laughs> <laughs>
Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Revolution Radio with Lorian Fenton on the Fenton Perspective here on Monday nights on Revolution Radio. And I think uh, our show tonight with Mad Painter is going to be the Mad Painter himself. He's going to give you all kinds of great information that you need. So be sure to stay tuned in tonight and listen to what he has to say. So, and also, I just want to thank Dr. Miller for coming on and speaking with Mary Electra because Mary's one of my favorite people, and I knew they hit it off really well with their sound antics, as I call it. And uh, so there we have it. But what I wanted to talk to Dr. Miller about tonight was he and I were speaking earlier about um, how, what was it, Dr. Miller, about how when babies are born, did the neurotransmitters in their brain get oh, yeah. stimulated? Well, Neurologic circuits, you know, the first one is the noradrenaline serotonin, you know, where there's yes. white flight. They get slid out into a hostile environment where they're cold and someone whacks them and then taking their fingerprints and, you know, weird things. It's uh, <laughs> no wonder everything. Yes, from. and not just their fingerprints anymore. They're giving them vaccinations and doing all kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah, it's all trauma-oriented. And it's it no is. wonder everybody's not neurotic. I mean, you know, everybody's got to have a... I <laughs> blame it on Rio. I, you know, I have to say that the way someone comes into this earth is a critical. I've whelped animal dogs and have seen a different kind of love, a different kind of devotion because of the way they were whelped. And so that translates right straight to humans. And uh, who was that? Steve Gaskins, Money right. Night Class. Then he later did the farm and spiritual midwifery. That book uh, is very explicit about the way you would maybe want to birth someone into the world so that they weren't colored. <laughs> is that the right word? Uh, with uh, neurotic behavior because of the way they come into right. the earth. You know, defense mechanism. The noradrenaline serotonin one. What that basically is about is as high as you get, like the little girls in grade school go, ee, 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 ee. you know, <laughs> that place, uh, well, well, okay, that's called ricocheting off walls, ka-ching, ching, like a pinball. Now, that place will cause the brain states to require an equal level of, of depression for homeostasis, and that's why the mood swings are so apparent and one of the reasons why people suggest meditation, you know, to try to slow down the over response to something. You know, getting all you know, that's the noradrenaline serotonin one. And what that is is basically a geometric engram in a convoluted brain. It actually has specific geometry that when you start overlaying other uh, geometries uh, from other neurologic circuits, drugs, uh, that it will create a mm, geometric body, uh, inner one, that's kind of like metaphorical, who you are and what you do, because it's like preferred pathways in the brain, and that's where you're going to normally go type, type of thing. And some of that's set right at birth, you know, how you come out of the the womb. So there it is. You know, it's very important to to uh, have set and setting. That's Timothy Leary. That's set and setting. You know, the yes, way you're going to yeah. do it with this thing and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah. Ritual is the ritual of it is how you celebrate the myth. And I wanted to do one last thing about sound that's really important. You know, zero point energy and that thing. Um, uh -huh. In the appendishads. The voice of the silence. They talk about the lost chord, uh, that, that, that ringing in your right ear. It's, an, it's a real strange thing in the, in the old books. They didn't distinguish right and left. They, they were very explicit in saying for everyone it was a sound in the right ear. And what you do is Simran and Budgeon. That means Simran is when you do... Uh, God names over and over, trying to drive your mind into being bored, and, you know, quiet or something. Good luck. Uh, well, I that's what you do. And still, it works no, real I, well. I got to tell but. you, I haven't heard it described as driving your brain into boredom ever before. So I want to tell you, that's <laughs> well, probably that's a what first. No, ringy, no, ringy, no, ringy. And, you know, it's like, 
hitting yourself with a flying a flying a frack flying pan or something. Bob. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I've always wondered about that. Anyhow, okay. Go then, on. then what happens is, at some point, you may or not hear a sound in your right ear, and the voice of the silence talks about ten different frequency bands that you might up here, and each represents a spiritual level of attainment, whether it's a bagpipe or it's a, it's a hissing sound or it's a, you know, a flute. Uh, there are different layers of that, and that's in the voice of the silence. A lot of different people translated that uh, book, uh, you know, uh, with Blavatsky and Crowley and others. But, but those, um, that sound is called the Shabbat, S-H-A-B-D, the voice of the silence. That is the serpent at the end of the rainbow singing. And that's the call, so called, what they call zero-point energy. You know, the, you know, that place. And that is an interesting thing because uh, what happens in some of the householder yogas is that if, if it's true, it's not tinnitus, your ear isn't just ringing from a tinnitus or something, or microwave beaming, uh, that it's real. What happens is... Um, you experience what is called the little death, where your, you, your soul literally leaves the body and goes home for a brief moment. Uh, Sharon Singh uh, would write about that and called the little the die to live. That was his book. Uh, Sar Bachchan and a bunch of others have written on that area that is interesting. But really, it's um, to be distinguished, soul travel is to be, dis and you know, Warner, uh, Warner Eckhart and some of the others, Eckhart. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, okay, they all, well, Eckhart studied under a uh, great master in the 20s. Uh, Sharon Singh was the grandson. I was initiated by him. You know, the cool part with him uh, was when he chose me for initiation, because I, you don't get to, you know, I want initiation, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. you got to go through <laughs> a couple of years of being a vegetarian, you know, blah, 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 meditating. Um, he looked me in the, straight in the eye. That's called darshan. That's the eyeball to eyeball thing. And he right. said to me, at the moment of my death, that he personally would be there to take me across the abyss. Now, I'm a physicist, so that's a pretty good hallucination. And, uh, you know, nobody else has ever offered to take me further than that. And his name, Sharon, isn't that Boatman and language or something. I forget how that I turn on the boat. I man. think it is. Ever, I think it is the boatman. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine that. Uh, everything is in metaphor. I love it. You know, because I see the layers uh, on on each other, and it's just that is about the level of consciousness that we all can do. It just most of us are lazy, and you know, kicking and screaming. I believe is the right word. You know, I, yeah, I, I don't want to go. So. I don't want to do this. I want to have some fun, <laughs> escape, or uh, whatever. But uh, it's uh, everybody's got to do it. And guess what? Uh, nobody gets out alive. <laughs> you got to all do it. That's the way it is, whether you like it or not. And so uh, I would suggest that everybody begin learning how to chant. That's a good way to recalibrate your body in magic uh they do it with uh, what is that called middle middle pillar there you go and you chant these god names and they cause the different chakras to vibrate she was doing it with a flute i uh was going to do it like kill bill <laughs> with my flute <laughs> but, 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 show, but show anger management where i did it with a didgeridoo and i blew a kenny g note for nine minutes and show everybody how mad i am <laughs> I would love to have been there for that experience. Oh, my hey, God. Oh, cool. You know, I watched Kenny G do that once. He, the, the band came up on stage, and everybody got up and was applauding, but only Kenny G wasn't there. And all of a sudden, you heard this note off to the side up at gate three, and Kenny G took nine minutes walking through the crowd, blowing a single note before he got up on stage. Now, do you think that's a pretty cool way to start off a concert? <laughs> I don't well, have to no, there with sounds, my mouth open, and I decided, Richard, you, you know, know it's like in that movie, like I want to have what she's eating. <laughs> yeah. Hey, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Okay, good, because I was just trying to to interrupt. She was muffled. You're perfect, four by four. I've got a okay. good 
Wonderful. Yeah. So what I yeah. was going to say about the Kenny G experience of him blowing that note, so he's obviously no, no, very yeah, much no. aware of setting the, the vibration for his concert, is what you're telling me. Well, that's basically, there's ritual there. Yes, there, now we're going that. There's different layers of what's going on there. And some of it is intuitive on his part. Sure. Some of it is orchestrated, obviously, by some black magician there. But, but no, I'm kidding. But the whole <laughs> thing was about sound and how it affects everybody. You know, we have a thing called the Mozart effect, which uh, everybody, even savages, are drawn to classical music. Why? Because it requires the use of parts of your brain that are not normally used, and it's like exercising, and you can't get enough of it. Exactly. That's what it's all about. That's and what also, music. Also, if you listen to classical music uh, for enough length of time, and I don't know how long most of the movements in the concertos last, but if you listen to it long enough, it does start releasing endorphins in your body. Well, it will because you're you're going into an altered state. Exactly. Uh, it's not unconscious, not. But it's, but it's different than the conscious state. And that place is uh, another gift from God. And you can do things in that state that you can't do in, um, in a conscious state. The, the Amish uh, used to play Mozart to their lair hands to create a low cholesterol egg. <laughs> Less stress. Really? Yeah. Was this a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They wait, did wait, it up in them. It's was, all the way down. And, um, was this a study that somebody did, or was this something the I did it. I sold them porcelain from the uh, Fort McDowell River, uh, which was <laughs> a low terrestrial, it was a terrestrial source for omega-3s, and we played Mozart. And it's free range chicken. And that, what happened next was a low cholesterol egg, less stress in the cluck, and more of the egg came before the chicken. There it is. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, what year did you do that? Oh, shoot. That was back in 90, um, 89, 1989. It's on CNN. They, they did that all the way up and down the coast advertising. Basically, the egg had, no, I think it was, well, it was 25% lower cholesterols. Um, and something about the music caused the chicken not to, and you know, they have like 50,000 layer hens or something, you know, all crap. Right, you know, right, sure. But free range, and, you know, so they're running around watching for hawks and whatever. And uh, it was amazing how the chicken, they were eating foods that were localist, you know, uh, you know, omega-3s, omega-6s, out of first line. But the music made the difference. And... You know, it's just, if you play that kind of thing with children that are being born, where they come into an environment which has got colored rooms, right, you know, like green or, or, or yellow or whatever, and, and they are playing these kinds of music, uh -huh. it gates behavior in terms of how those engrams are first imprinted on the brain. You know, the, you, know, oh, you get the big rush the first time you come out of the womb, and it drives a bunch of neurotransmitters in a direction through the brain, and it creates a basic engram, uh, which will eventually look, especially like sacred geometry, your personality, your, what would you call that, your sacred body. <laughs> you know, that yeah. geometric element inside the brain of preferred pathways of neurotransmitters. And what I'm doing is trying to give you a scientific explanation that you can envision in your mind's eye because who knows how it really works. Right. It's not, right. Hey, well, okay. you know, okay, it's not about I, yeah. how it works. It, but what it's about is you getting it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And let me yeah. ask you something. We have about, oh, I'd say 10, 11, or 12 minutes left here because sure. I never Anywhere know when we're going to end. But what I'd like to ask you is, how does this relate to autism? Have you done any studies on that, or do you, are you aware of anything? I've, about got, would have, I've got a senior ADD is what they say I have. I, I call it brain cloud. Um, let's see. Yeah, autism is different than savant. I am more of a savant because I had dedic imaging. Uh, my, my gift was my mind is a certain kind of a weirdness. And, and so I have a way of looking at things a little differently than most. And 
I have the credentials of being able to flex when I do that. It doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> it really, what's true is when you get it and then can do it for yourself. That's the true part. And, okay. Uh, but what, yeah, what, what I'm asking is the, the birthing process and the neurotransmitters and everything that you were talking about previously, yeah. Does yeah. that have anything to do with why children are coming out with autism? Do you think no, that... No, it has to do with inoculations and the bullshit that they're doing to the children now that's Thank atrocious you. and criminal. And really, Thank it gets much worse than that because now, as you know, Monsanto has been able to do a transgenic soybean as a delivery system for inoculation. Now, they don't have to use a needle anymore. It's what? awful putting it in the children's food. I didn't know that. I didn't know it at all. Oh, oh my God. God. Started in <laughs> India with birth control, it worked. And then they moved to our wild horses, it's working. And now they're going to move it to Florida first as an experiment for inoculating children without needles and without permission. Oh, God. Why did you? Oh, now I'm really upset. Inoculations. You know, I, I've noticed on TV right now, they're talking about. Uh, what is that? Fibromyalgia is caused by chicken pox. If you add chicken pox, you're going to get fiber. You know, it's like scare tactics to make you go out and want to get a prescription or something. It's crazy because really uh, everybody has control of their own parasympathetic nervous system. Some people choose to be more sensitive than others. Some people choose to be more intuitive than others. These are the balances of homeostasis that you have options on when you start to explore the nature of consciousness. You have options, choice. And what I'm writing about now this, this week is chapter 8 on my new book on power tools that is about the nature and difference between free will and true will. Man does not have free will. Man has true will. He does not have rights. He has responsibilities. And it's a Simon Says kind of thing. You know, it's a process. It's not an end product. Consciousness is more vast than outer space. And it is uh, the board of the doll and all the roadmap of, you know, all the different inner landscape of, of, of the mind is a, it's a wonderful gift. And it, nobody is actually trying to explore it. Mostly drugs are used now for escape or recreation. But Timothy Leary said there are, the Buddhists get high for four reasons, only one for, for escape and recreation. There are three other reasons for doing that. And being a navigate of inner space is uh, probably what has made me who I am. Here I am. Yes. And anybody can do it. It's not yeah. about me. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we all should be in, responsible you know. for our inner space <laughs> and our own time and our own ability to to navigate our existence. And yeah, and you're take, absolutely take right personal responsibility. responsibility. <laughs> yeah, there you go. For and intent, the intention yeah. of what you're doing. Why? Intention. Exactly. Yeah, I was just we were like stereo there for a second, Rick. I think we're in trouble. Well, there you are, firing the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> God. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Um, what yeah. I, you know, it's, six, it's about uh, six minutes till we're off the air, and i got to ask you this. Sure. Tonight is the third presidential debate that we're going up against. Uh, yeah. uh, most yeah. people are, are watching it, or if it's over by now, I'm not sure. But um, what are your views on uh, politics? So who cares? Okay. Uh, all 18 <laughs> candidates, you know, including Ralph Nader, are not being asked the really important questions. And I challenge, we, I represent a league of concerned scientists, and I'm extremely intelligent. Uh, we've communicated directly with Kathy Crowley. Uh, the bottom line is, what about Fukushima? What about those fault lines and all those nuclear reactors on the fault lines? What about uh, the grid going down, and what infrastructure is available? And what is this thing about food? You know, I have a lot of questions, and yes. uh, I don't have answers. I have some directions. I think food should be, now, instead of privatizing water, I think food should become a recreational sport where it's your divine right, 
And where you choose to live is you eat your environment, like Gurdjieff said, and you barter for what you want, I like burrito corn chips or whatever. The thing is, uh, food is uh, should not be on a monetary system. If it's not, now gardening is no longer a terrorist event with FDA, and Monsanto can't sue you for not using their GMOs. And so you have you can walk away from it. There's no, no wait, wait, uh, wait, wait. Monsanto cannot sue you now when you're when you're uh, your you're seat not doing your crops for for monetary bar. You know you're not doing it for money, and it's no longer about the monetary system. That's zeitgeist moving forward. If it's no longer right. about money, Monsanto is out of it. They can't tell you what to do. They can't sue you like they are. Suing farmers. Right, are, right, exactly. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to become exempt, not an adept, and certainly not, uh, you know, they're vulgar. There's three ways of being in this era, world. There's the vulgar, the adept, and the exempt. And what we're all aspiring toward is some form of supreme individual sovereignty or art to art. And that's what it's about. Independence of everything, where you get to choose and pick what you choose to participate in or not. Exactly. Good and luck. You know, it's just, <laughs> yeah, good yeah, luck. I know. I know. Well, and that like, means, we, okay, anybody that would thwart those rights is also now Libra's. That's Libra means book. OZ, not the wizard. Libra's is in effect, and check out what that means. And that's what it's really truly about. Your true will and your rights to that part of it. Man and does not starts. actually have rights. What he has actually is responsibilities. You don't have a right to be free. You have a responsibility to be free. And you, a man, is responsible for the thoughts he chooses to entertain. Yes. There it is. That's, Read it and wait. Yeah, it has no, nothing to do with mind control anymore. When I do Alex Jones, I'm going to put it like that because, in fact, Nobody can actually make you do anything. They can try to trick you. Golden Arches, watch that and how it triggers the young kids as an icon. Right out of Dragonfly, or Serenity, what was that? Uh, Serenity, uh, that science fiction movie, you know, yeah. where the girl was triggered with, with geometry and light. That's what the Golden Arches are about. There's your mind control. Yeah, also Disney the and CIA all the other put it, stuff. Mind control, we, we, we don't need mind control, we've got TV. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know, Richard. I know. It's just, it, you know, and as you were saying, I want to close this out because we probably only have two or three minutes left. But I just wanted to say that at the Reno event, uh, one of the conclusions that we came to that you gave us, actually, is that it's not going to be you and I that change the world or maybe even our children. But it's, it's going to be children that are six years old or younger. And we now need to understand that. It's our education system is in shambles. Uh, it is an embarrassment for someone like me to realize what we have allowed our neighbors and, and, and values to become. I remember yeah. when I was a little kid, education was the single most important thing in the world. That's why I didn't have sex. I was afraid I'd get someone pregnant and I couldn't go to college. There you go. <laughs> well, what's happened? The whole thing, who cares? I know. You know. It's like important. I know, it is. It's very important, but they're not given they're not giving the education that they need to survive in this world and you know so it's gonna be that that thirteen year old that addressed the assembly, the gen the UN assembly was two years ago when she said, you know, when you were my age, you didn't have to worry about the food you ate or the water you drink or the air you breathe. What have you done to our generation? And that's yes. the truth of it. And it will only be the six-year-olds and younger will most likely make those changes.